When you hold a recognised world title for 11 combined years across two reigns, the moniker of living legend is pretty much upped for the remainder of your lifetime. And yet for Bruno Sammartino, his accomplishments as a celebrated wrestling champion only tell part of the story. In a world where our heroes sometimes let us down with moments of weakness or well-covered deceit, Sammartino was the genuine article. He defined himself with as much integrity and principle outside of the ring as he did in between the ropes. A super athlete with seemingly limitless strength, Bruno's muscle was just as strong as the character of the man himself. I'm Jack from Cultaholic.com and this is the captivating career of Bruno Sammartino. At one time a weightlifter with Olympic dreams, Italian expat San Martino became a local legend in his American hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where his feats of strength brought him celebrity on the regional television show of broadcaster Bob Prince in the 1950s. He was discovered by wrestling promoter Rudy Miller, who coaxed the young San Martino into the business. Getting his start locally, San Martino made his debut in the autumn of 1959, defeating Dmitry Grabowski in under 20 seconds. Months after his debut in early 1960, San Martino made his Madison Square Garden Garden debut where the powerful novice defeated notorious wildman Bull Curry in just five minutes. These short matches were par for the course for San Martino in his early days, dominant wins over a bevy of villains, establishing the youngster as an irresistible force. Throughout 1960, San Martino's list of victims included Lou Albano, Skull Murphy, Angelo Sibaldi, and rather famously the 600 pound Haystacks Calhoun. It was against Haystacks that San Martino astonished New York fans by lifting Calhoun off of his feet, something very few, if anyone one else was able to do. Sammartino gained experience in those earlier years working with noted names such as Eddie Graham and The Crusher in cities such as Chicago, Montreal and San Francisco. Late in 1960, Sammartino tangled with fellow babyface Antonino Rocca, the wave of the future facing the Garden's top babyface star for over a decade. The two came to a stalemate in their Big Apple battles, with Rocca winning the first match via DQ before going to a 34 minute curfew draw against one another three weeks later. In the spring of 1962, Bruno had a report reported falling out with New York promoter Vincent J. McMahon, which led to him being put on a national suspension, where other promoters would not use him either. So for the next year, he primarily wrestled in Toronto, Canada, where he wrestled NWA world champion Buddy Rogers on several occasions, and held the international tag team titles alongside whipper Billy Watson. Sammartino had become a major sensation in Toronto, aided in part to their large Italian population in the area, and before long, McMahon tried to bring Bruno back to New York City. At first, Bruno refused due to the effective attempt at blacklisting him, and because he found himself loyal to Toronto promoter Frank Tunney, who utilised him when others wouldn't. But he did return in early 1963, reportedly because part of the deal to bring him back involved having him beat Rogers, now recognised as the WWWF World Champion. Sammartino returned to MSG that February, teaming with Bobo Brazil to defeat Johnny Barrend and the Magnificent Maurice. Bruno's return saw him guzzling up the opposition with his usual overpowering spirit, a list of opponents that included Boris Malenko, the father of Dean Malenko. In March 63, Sammartino Martino lost a 25-minute match to now NWA world champion Luthez in Toronto, but his real prize lay mere months ahead. The following month, San Martino fought Rogers to a no contest in a WWF title bout in Washington, D.C., a match in which Buddy Rogers submitted to San Martino's backbreaker, but since he jumped Bruno before the bell, the match had never actually started. In the minds of fans, San Martino was the uncrowned champion, but his coronation need not wait much longer. On Friday, May 17, 1963, before nearly 20,000 fans inside Madison Square Garden, San Martino tore into Rogers, hoisted him up in the same backbreaker submission and drew a surrender from the ailing champion. In just 48 seconds, the 27-year-old Bruno San Martino was the world heavyweight champion. It had long been reported that Rogers was suffering from serious heart problems at the time and wasn't in good enough shape to have a real match, hence the San Martino blitz victory. A rematch between the two was scheduled for October 4th of that year at the Roosevelt Stadium in Jersey City, but Rogers pulled out weeks before the bout. Instead, San Martino was issued a 
very sizable replacement, the £400 Gorilla Monsoon. The Manchurian monster actually won the match via referee's decision due to excessive blood loss on Bruno's part, but he didn't win the title per the rules of the day. Gorilla remained a massive thorn in San Martino's side, going to a double countout with him at the Garden later that month, before defeating Monsoon via countout after a 25 minute brawl in November, after San Martino launched the super heavyweight from the ring. It wasn't until June 1964 that San Martino decisively beat Gorilla Monsoon, defeating him in a two out of three falls match just one month after the two battled to a 70 minute draw again at the Garden. San Martino continued to imbue his record with impressive victories, including a submission win over Giant Barba in February 64 and over Freddie Blassie later that year. Another test of San Martino's endurance came when he battled Waldo von Erich to an 81 minute draw that August before defeating him in subsequent rematches. In early 65, San Martino gained a new rival in a young cowboy Bill Watts, after the ornery Watts turned on him following a tag team match. The two fought over the title, a rivalry that included a Texas death match, but Bruno would prevail in the end, including in a two out of three falls bout where he rendered Bill Watts unable to continue. While San Martino is most identified with being the king of wrestling in New York, he did venture out to other territories to defend the championship. These regions included the Sheik's big time wrestling in Detroit, Michigan, his old stomping ground of Frank Tunney's Toronto group, and even Stu Hart's Stampede, where he won a pair of matches over Waldo Von Erich in the summer of 65. He even defended the title for Jim Barnett's Australian territory in April 66, defeating Killer Kowalski. As the 60s wore on, San Martino continued to fell all challenges, including Professor Toru Tanaka, Hans Mortier, and Johnny Valentine. In 68, San Martino began suffering through a serious back injury, continuing to defend the belt into the start of his reign's sixth year, but he ailed terribly and asked to drop the title. The date of the impending title switch continued to be put off, while San Martino forged painfully ahead. Dispatching George Steele in a heated rivalry that culminated with Texas death and stretcher matches that year, and also warring with The Sheik, toppling the legendary madman in steel cage matches in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. 1969 dawned, and still San Martino held the title, his request to lose the belt placed on the back burner. All the while, he remained a gallant champion, by now having dozens upon dozens of MSG sellouts to his name. The likes of Ivan Koloff, Crusher Verdu, and Beppo Mongol, which was a young Nikolai Volkov, all ended in a Bruno's radar, but were put away like every challenger before them. As the 60s drew to a close and the 70s dawned, McMahon continued with San Martino as his champion, setting new attendance records at Madison Square Garden in 1970 for his matches with Verdu. But San Martino finally made it abundantly clear that he needed time away to recover, and come 71, perhaps the most unthinkable title change ever took place, at least in the eyes of the fans. On Monday, January 18th, 1971, before a new record of over 21,600 fans at the Garden, San Martino lost the belt in 15 minutes to Ivan Koloff, ending the unsinkable reign at 2,803 days, or seven years, eight months. As the now legendary story goes, fans inside MSG did not immediately register that San Martino had lost the belt, and sat there in stunned silence, save for a few audible weeps and gasps. San Martino himself claims that he thought he'd gone deaf due to the sweeping dearth of sound immediately following the referee's three count. The immortal Bruno San Martino had been brought back to earth by the unruly Koloff, signalling the end of an era. Aside from two matches wrestled in February 71, San Martino took off for five months after the title loss. Upon his return in June, he and Dominic Danucci defeated the Mongols to win the WWWF's international tag team titles, though they only reigned with the belts for two weeks. In the latter part of 1971, San Martino embarked on a run in Japan, where he found himself working opposite Giant Barber and Antonio Inoki, as well as matches for various NWA groups in early 72. But by the spring, San Martino found himself back in New York, working underneath while Pedro Morales proved his mettle as the new big champion. San Martino faced Morales on Saturday, September 30th, 1972, before 22,000 fans at Shea Stadium in Queens, New York. This was to be a title match between two good friends that had recently come to blows during a tag team bout. With fans reportedly more in favor of the new reigning champion than the near 37-year-old Bruno, the two heroes battled to a draw after 65 minutes under a cold early autumn rain. With $140,000 plus drawn at the gate to see the two babyface icons collide, there seemed to be plenty of life in a possible San Martino encore. In 1973, Vince Senior and Vince Jr. approached San Martino with the request that he once again become champion. But sadly, and understandably, Bruno refused due to the grind of the schedule. In order to win him back, they made major concessions, including a reduced schedule where he would only work major arenas, and would receive a respectable percentage of the gate of every show he wrestled on. And so it came to pass on December 10th, 1973, when nine days after Stan Stasiak scored a controversial pinfall win over the champion Morales, San Martino defeated Stasiak at the garden in 12 minutes to capture the gold for a second time. Bruno picked up right where he left off as a popular
Formula Champion and Mega Draw in the Northeast, selling the garden out in title matches against Nikolai Volkov, Freddie Blassie, and Killer Kowalski. He even ended into a feud with former protege Spyros Arion, the Iron Greek, after Arion mauled San Martino student Larry Zabisco after a match in 1975. San Martino and Arion's feud encompassed several violent fights, culminating in a Greek death match. In this match, San Martino ripped and tore at Arion's injured leg before submitting him to a half Boston Crab, causing his wounded opponent to need assistance back to the locker room. In April 76, San Martino suffered a legitimately broken neck during a title defense against the hard hitting Stan Hansen after a botched body slam. In storyline, it was said that Hansen's devastating lariat is what did the deed, and it looked as though the company would be without its champion. But Bruno, after pleading from Vince Senior, made it to a match at Shea Stadium with Hansen at two months later and did manage to win the bout. The two continued to battle deep into 76, with San Martino once more vanquishing his difficult challenger. But with that lingering neck injury, Bruno once again requested to drop the belt. Before that title loss would come to pass, Bruno continued making successful defenses against a who's who of wrestling villains. These included the barnstorming bruiser Brody, previous champion Stan Stasiak, Olympic powerhouse Ken Patera, and Baron Von Raschke, with the crowds at the monthly garden shows continuing to demonstrate San Martino's star appeal. By the time of the Raschke match at the garden in April 77, however, San Martino was 41 years old, having reigned as WWF champion for 11 of the previous 14 years. And despite his more favorable schedule, Bruno was ready to move on from the demanding role of being New York's leading man. But it wasn't in New York, but rather Baltimore on April 30th, 1977, when San Martino lost the title for the second and final time. The man deposing him was the charismatic superstar Billy Graham, who, unlike Koloff and Stasiak, was not a vessel for transitioning the belt onto a new babyface. San Martino even acted as one of Graham's occasional challengers during Superstar's 10-month reign with the belt, falling short in regular bouts and in cage matches through the remainder of 77 and into 78. In fact, when Bruno lost a cage match to Graham in February 78 in Philadelphia, it was through sheer dumb luck, as a devastating strike knocked Graham through the doorway and to victory on the floor. San Martino wrestled a more sparse schedule as the 70s ground down, which included rekindling old hostilities with heels of the past, including Koloff and Steele. He also had new enemies in High Chief Peter Maivia, Greg Valentine, Johnny Valiant, and Hossein Arab, the future Iron Sheik. He even contended for the sometimes forgotten North American title, challenging Pat Patterson in the summer of 1979. The previous year, however, San Martino moved further into semi-activity, when he began providing color commentary duties on episodes of All-Star Wrestling and Championship Wrestling alongside host Vincent K. McMahon. But he had one more good run in him, a run that the generation of fans following his career prime know very well. At the turn of the 80s, San Martino's protege Larry Zabisco challenged Bruno to an exhibition match to prove his worth, a match which San Martino continuously turned down before ultimately accepting. In the bout, Zabisco was overmatched, and then he resorted to violent treachery, turning on his mentor and busting him open with a chair. San Martino swore revenge, and in the coming months, the acrimony built masterfully. Sellout bouts throughout the spring of 1980 failed to settle the grudge until they waged war in a steel cage at Shea Stadium that August before more than 36,000 fans. After beating Zabisco to a pulp, San Martino calmly strode out the door of the cage as the clear victor. Come 1981, San Martino wrestled what appeared to be his final matches, winding his career down after more than 20 years, the extreme majority of which were as an unassailable headliner. His final match with what was now the WWF came on October 4th, 1981, when he defeated old nemesis George Steele at the Meadowlands in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Later that week, he wrestled in three matches for All Japan Pro Wrestling, the final of which pitted he and Giant Baba against Taiga Jeet Singh and Umanosuke Ueda in Tokyo. Not long after his retirement, San Martino actually filed a lawsuit against Vince Senior over unpaid gay percentages from his second reign as champion. Vince Jr. settled the suit with an agreement for Bruno to return as commentator, which he did in September 84. Beginning in 1985, San Martino returned to the ring on a part-time basis, usually working tag team matches alongside the likes of Andre the Giant, Paul Orndorff, and Tito Santana, while also supporting son David San Martino, most prolifically at the first WrestleMania. He even got involved in a couple of very intense feuds, one with Rowdy Roddy Piper that culminated in a steel cage match at Boston Garden in 86, and one with the Macho Man Randy Savage later that year over the IC title. WrestleMania 2 marked what was the only pay-per-view bout for San Martino and for Pedro Morales as well, when both men worked the 20-man battle royal in Chicago, Illinois. What turned out to be Bruno's final match occurred in Baltimore on August 29th, 1987, when he and world champion Hulk Hogan defeated King Kong Bundy and the One Man Gang. 
After finishing his WWF commentary career in 1988, Bruno did become an outspoken critic of the company due to various scandals and culture issues, while making guest appearances for Herb Abrams' UWF and even for WCW. But by 2013, San Martino had reconciled with the company and headlined the Hall of Fame class in the same year in New York, allowing him to headline Madison Square Garden one last time. Upon his passing in 2018 at the age of 82, tributes and memories of the living legend all affirmed what had been known for years. That Bruno Sammartino was more than just a champion inside the ring and that he was a man of honour and integrity that walked the walk and meant every word that he breathed. Sammartino's stature as a genuine man's man in every walk of life will forever keep his legacy living. Thanks very much for watching and let us know what you think in the comments section down below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter at Cultaholic and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do, then please do check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic, where you can pledge. And don't forget, of course, most importantly of all, to hit subscribe and to join us.